Hello and good morning dear students and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IS. We have lined up another session of the Hindu news analysis for all of you. So what are the articles we will be taking up today? We have four articles that we will be analyzing in detail. First is regarding the issue of mob lynching and vigilantism. The Supreme Court it has asked the Home Ministry and various states to do something regarding the increases in stances of mob lynching and vigilantism in the country. The second article is about digital India, specifically digital payments. See, after demonetization and because of COVID, there was a huge influx of people who were using UPI now. Right? However, what is the exact scenario of financial inclusion in the country? The third article, it is about India's relations with Australia. Now recently, two Indian military aircrafts, they visited an island territory of Australia known as the Cocos Island. So what was it about? Why is this important for India? We'll take a look at that as well. Next is about the recently passed Sinatograph Bill. Now this bill was recently passed, passed in one of the houses of the parliament, that is the Raj Sabha. So what are the issues, what are the provisions of this bill? We'll take a look at that as well. In the prelim section, we have one very small topic regarding Sam Altman, who is the CEO of what? Open AI, whose product is Chat GPT. So there is one biometric project that is associated with this person. What it is? Because this kind of question, it can be asked in your prelims. They'll give the term, the world coin, what it is, and they'll give you the options. Okay, so that is why it becomes important from a prelims perspective. So coming to our first topic, see the Supreme Court. It was hearing a case, a plea that was filed by an agency, an association regarding the mob lynching in the country. So Supreme Court has asked various states like the states of Maharashtra, Odisha, Rajasthan, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh and Haryana and along with that the central ministry, the central home ministry it has asked all of them to give a response on what all are they doing regarding mob lynching in their states and in the country as a whole. Now this was specially in the regard of their failure to adopt and implement the guidelines that were given, already given, very clearly stated and given by the Supreme Court in a case in the year 2018. Now who filed this petition? This petition was filed by an agency National Federation of Indian Women, which is the woman wing of the CPI, the Communist Party of India. So what was this 2018 guideline and this case? See, there was this case known as Tehseen S. Poonawala versus Union of India 2018. Now in this case, when Supreme Court heard about the mob lynching and the increased instances of vigilantism in the country, they established certain guidelines. Now, historically, if there is no law regarding any particular thing, Supreme Court, it usually provides the guidelines for the same, over which later on the parliament can enact certain laws, right? We, it was done also in the case of Vishaka guidelines, right? On the same case, on the same way, these guidelines, they were released under this case. So what were the guidelines? The first thing that the Supreme Court stated was that it is the sacrosanct duty, the highest duty of the state to protect the lives of its citizen. So during lynching, if the life of a citizen or multiple citizens are lost, then that is a big failure for the state. The authorities, apart from the state, the various authorities of the state, the various law enforcement agencies, they also have, have a principal obligation or a very high amount of obligation to prevent any kind of vigilantism. It is the duty of the judiciary 
and the law enforcement agency to determine whether a person is guilty or not. The mob cannot do that, right? So it is the duty of the enforcement agency to ensure that this vigilantism, it does not take place in the country. So for this, for this purpose to reduce such instances, the Supreme Court in the guideline said that there should be a nodal officer in every district. Now this officer should not be below the rank of superintendent of police, that is SP. Okay. Now this person, they will be dedicated towards preventing any such instances in the district, right? In case any FIR needs to be filed, it should be ensured that that should be immediate. There should be no delay in filing of the FIRs. Now, once the FIR is filed, the station head officer, the station head officer, they need to inform this nodal officer and the nodal officer, it needs to take care or ensure that the family members of the people who were lynched, the people who were victims, they are not further harassed. Also, any kind of investigation in such cases, it needs to be monitored by this nodal agent, by this nodal officer, right? There should also be, the state should also put into place schemes of compensation for the victims of any such crimes. Moreover, if the nodal agencies, if these nodal officers or the enforcement agencies, they fail to comply with any kind of these guidelines, then in that case, it is the duty of the state, the duty of the department to take action against such officers within a span of six months. Moreover, this is from the law perspective, right? Law enforcement perspective. Here, the Home Ministry and the state government, they also have the responsibility to sensitize the law enforcement agents and also to warn the public regarding the dire consequences. The public should be scared in such a way that they do not get involved in any such instances. So, in this hearing where the Supreme Court has asked various states to take certain actions, they have questioned the accountability, they have questioned the states, what is the further course of action. On July 10, the Supreme Court has already asked these states to file a report and this report should contain the number, all the number of the cases that has taken place since the 2018 with regards to mob vigilantism and mob lynching. They also need to file in this report what action has been taken. So the Supreme Court can identify where are the gaps. Moreover, the Attorney General of India, he has promised the Supreme Court that the Home Ministry will sit together with the ministers of the state to ensure to get an idea about how these states are complying with these guidelines and what can be the various remedial measures. Now, what are the issues with mob vigilantism? Why is Supreme Court so worried about it? See, these cases of mob lynching, of mob vigilantism, they have been increasing rapidly in the country for the past few years. We all know that we have seen in the newspapers, right? However, please note that India, it goes by the rule of law. Rule of law is the most supreme in a civilized country like India. Now, in case mob lynching happens, what is happening? The natural justice, principles of natural justice, they are being violated. The rule of law is being violated. The person who is being lynched, they are not getting any chance to be heard by a neutral authority. So that means their natural justice, they are not getting access to natural justice. The rule of law in India states that only the judiciary of India can determine whether a person is guilty or not. No other agency can do the same. So this person is not getting a chance to be heard by the judiciary as well. So there is a big question mark on rule of law and violation of principles of natural justice, which eventually violates 
the various declarations made under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to which India is a signatory. Apart from that, this is also a clear violation of both Articles 14 as well as Article 15 which provide fundamental rights to equality to all the citizens of the country and right against any kind of discrimination. The people who are being lynched, who are not getting any chance of being heard in the courts of law, their fundamental rights, they are being questioned upon. Moreover, it also violates Article 21. Because these people, these victims, they are being treated as second grade citizens. They are not getting any opportunity to be heard. Their dignity, their basic human dignity, it is being violated. So three fundamental rights, the rule of law, the principle of natural justice, as well as the declaration of human rights, all are being violated by these actions. So what is the solution? See, currently there is no provision in the Indian Penal Code regarding mob lynching. So all the cases, even according to the government of India, all the cases which come under mob lynching, they are to be considered as murder cases. So they will be dealt with under sections 300 and 302 of the IPC. We need to change that. We need to have proper provisions in the Indian Penal Code regarding mob lynching activities. Secondly, the states, they also need to take up the responsibility. See, law and order, public law and order, it is a part of what? A state subject. Right? The police, it comes under the authority of states except in Delhi. Right? So the states also need to take up responsibilities. They also need to enact laws against such activities. The guidelines of the Supreme Court under the Poonawala case, they can be incorporated in such laws. As of now, three states, including Rajasthan, West Bengal, and ironically, even Manipur, where very recently there were many cases of mob lynching, they have enacted laws against mob lynching. The Jharkhand Act, Jharkhand also passed an act, the Assembly of Jharkhand also passed an act, but it was pending governor's approval. So governor rejected the bill on the basis of two reasons. One, the definition of the mob in this particular act was not according to the international standards. And second was that there were mismatches between the Hindi as well as the English versions of the law. Apart from that, because this is a very big social problem as well, so there is a need for civil society as well to step in. The civil society needs to step in to improve societal and communal harmony in the country. This particular issue of us versus them, it should not exist in, within a country. For example, in the state of Tamil Nadu, where historically many such movements, many such secular and rational movements have taken place, such vigilantism and mob lynching activities, they are quite rare. Even when certain politicians, they try to incite or support such activities, these civil society organizations, they oppose them vehemently. Moreover, there is a need that people should have an increased amount of trust in the judicial system of the country. Because if people feel that this case, if registered over there, so someone robs you, so you think that if you go and file a case against this person, it will take many and many years for that case to get solved. So instead, you want instant justice, you take part in lynching. Right? So that should not happen. The belief and the trust of the people in the judicial system needs to be improved. And for that, the first step is judicial reform specifically with regards to judicial delays with, in solving the various cases. Now we come to the second article which is related to Digital India. See, right now what is happening? Every shop you go, from big corporations to your Golgappa Bhaiya. Everyone has what? A QR code. 
which you can easily scan through your UPI apps and pay, right? So everyone, many people in every location, in every nooks and corners of the country, they know about UPI system. But what is the level of usage of the system? What is the level of financial inclusion in India? We'll take a look over here. See, UPI, it was introduced back in April 2016. So this is not a post-demonetization activity. It was introduced much before demonetization occurred in November. Right? However, UPI, it gained this, this popularity, this huge popularity after demonetization. When the notes of 5,000 and 1,000, they were removed from the economy, it took some time for the cash economy to come back to its level. And meanwhile, the digital economy, it saw a boom. Later on, during the COVID pandemic, people wanted to do what? Cashless or contactless payments. Because they thought on the notes, there can be viruses that can be transmitted from one person to another if they exchange notes. So many apps, many grocery apps as well, they were providing what? Contactless, contactless deliveries. So because of that, the popularity of UPI it kept on increasing. In fact, according to a report, from June 2021 to April 2023, the UPI payments, they grew at an average monthly rate of 6% monthly rate, not annual rate, okay? So that is quite huge. Compare that to other modes of payment like NEFT, that is National Electronics Fund Transfer or IMPS, Immediate Payment System and the debit card payments. Their growth rates were almost half or even less than half. So that showed that the popularity of UPI as a system, it increased with leaps and bounds compared to the other payment systems. Also, the share of the UPI payments in the total value of digital retail system in the country, it has also been increasing. It has increased from less than 20% in mid-2021 to now 27% in March 2023. So this increase has been at the cost of reduction in the role of NEFT and this reduction was almost 10%. So UPI, it is taking off very fast. It is replacing, it is trying to replace all the other modes of payment very quickly. But has this translated into financial inclusion? Does this popularity of UPI system mean that every person in India has these UPI apps, they have their bank accounts and their bank accounts are active in nature? So what is the reality? According to World Bank's Global Findex Survey, 53%, only 53% population of India had bank accounts in the year 2014. Later on, because of Jan Dhan Yojana and the push by the government for financial inclusion, in 2021, according to this report, the number of the number of people, the population that had bank accounts, what was 80% in 2017. This is 2017.2917. However, out of these. 38% of the population, their accounts, they are inactive. Out of these 80%, 38%, they are inactive in nature. So that makes India having the highest share of inactive accounts in the world. What is the biggest reason given for this by the article writer? It is that during the Jandhan Yojana period, what happens, what happened, many zero balance account, they were opened up by the officials in order to fulfill their targets. Now these accounts, they never saw their amount increase or decrease. It was already zero. No one came to put money in those accounts. They were just opened for the sake of opening. Also, apart from this, apart from inactive bank accounts, what is another problem? There is a gender inequality in usage 
of these accounts. More women than men have inactive accounts. 32% of women, their accounts are inactive, whereas for men, it is 23%. In case of rural and urban regions also this difference it exists. There was no difference when the accounts were opened. There was no divide between the rural and the urban spaces with regards to possession of the bank accounts. So both the locations they had equal proportion of people having bank accounts. However in the rural areas the proportion of the inactive bank accounts is 31%. Whereas in the rural area in the urban areas, it is just 23%. With regards to income groups, with regards to them as well, there was no difference in possession levels of the bank accounts. However, if we compare the poorest 40% and the rest of the 60% of the population, you can see that in 40% in of the Indians, the 40% poorest Indians, 35% of them they have inactive bank accounts whereas in rest of 60% of them only 22% they have inactive bank accounts. So you can see this difference rural urban male female rich and poor there does exist some difference. With regards to digital transaction how does this difference exist? Only 35% of the population carried out digital transactions. Even now many sections of the population they do not trust the digital systems. They think that if we give our card information to this website all our money from our account it will disappear one day. So many people they have huge trust deficit with usage of these digital transactions. There are also other problems associated with it. What are the problems? We will take a look in the upcoming slides. But here the data says that only 35% of the population they carried out any kind of digital transaction in the year 2021. Digital transaction means sending money or even receiving money. So 35% only they did that. The rest of the population, the rest of the 65% population it did not. However, we can see, say that the, there has been an improvement over the previous years. In 2014, it was just 22%. In 2017, it was 29%. Now it is 35%. However, compared to other countries, this is a very unimpressive figure. Okay, we have just 35%, whereas the global average is 57% just for the developing countries. The average for developing countries is 57. India is 22 points behind. Global average is 64%. India is almost 30 points behind. Also, here as well, there is a sharp gender gap. Only 41% males and 28% females. So there was a gap almost of 13% with regards to usage of digital transactions between males and females. Now this gap, it is higher compared to other comparable developing countries. What are other comparable developing countries? We have Brazil, China, Kenya and Vietnam. However, Bangladesh, it did have a bigger gender gap compared to India. But the absolute numbers for Bangladesh, both for males and females, they were higher. For males, it is 58% they are using digital systems, whereas for females, it is 34%. You need not remember this data, only you need to st state that compared to other comparable economies, the level of gender gap in India is quite high. There is also a rural and urban divide with regards to use of digital payments compared to the other comparable economies. In 2021, only 30% of the rural population and 40% of the urban population use digital transaction. Lower than comparable countries like Bangladesh and Kenya. So what is the solution? One, I said there needs to be an awareness built amongst the people who already are used who already have active bank accounts, their awareness should be made that the digital transactions, they are safe. 
they are properly encrypted and very safe in nature so that they can start using these payment systems. Moreover, there is a need to increase the internet access and speed amongst the, amongst the various locations of India. Okay, even now if you go to a slightly rural location, the internet speed it dips. We can, we say we have 5G in cities like Delhi, Bangalore, but in the rural locations, the speed is still almost comparable to 2G. So that is also something that needs to be targeted. Moreover, this behavioral change, it needs to be instilled amongst the people regarding their banking activities. See, in Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, what did we do? In Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, we were able to change the behavior of the people through targeted campaigns. Many people, they didn't think that toil having toilets in their houses is a clean thing. But we changed this mindset of the people. Similarly, those kind of campaigns, they need to be started for use of banking systems as well. Also, there needs to be an increase in the awareness regarding the benefits of these digital payments. How they can instantly transfer money from one place to another. So, the people who are still not using it, the awareness regarding them, it needs to be increased. Now, we come to the next topic, which is regarding Indian aircrafts. A Navy Dornier maritime patrol aircraft and an Indian Air Force C-130 transport aircraft. They both visited the Cocos Island, the Cocos Keeling Island of Australia. So India's Navy Dormier maritime patrol aircraft and C-130 transport aircraft both visited the Cocos Keeling Island of Australia. Where is Coco Keeling? Here. So this is Australia. This is Indonesia. We have Cocos Keeling over here. You can see Sri Lanka over here. The Andaman and Nicobar Islands over here. So south of Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Now this is a latest activity in a series of India's growing military to military engagement specifically in the Indo-Pacific region with many other countries. This is with Australia. Previously, in February 2023, we also engaged in the same manner with the country of Indonesia. When the submarine INS Sindhu Kesari it docked in Jakarta in Indonesia. So we are trying to increase our engagements in the area, our friendly relations with regards to defense and strategic operations with the countries in the Indo-Pacific region. Now, India and Cocos Island of Australia, they have a history associated. Okay, this is not the first time that India has docked on the Cocos Island. Cocos Island is also useful for our space program. So this is the location where a temporary ground station is being constructed by Australia for our Gaganyaan mission. In, in 2022, the Australian Space Agency chief, he visited ISRO and both the chiefs, they discussed about various other space cooperations that can be done via this island. What kind of space cooperations? Cooperation in earth observation, in satellite navigation, space situational awareness identifying what is the situation of the space, whether there are any solar activities, what is the situation of space debris, weather and climate studies specifically with regards to changing climate of the world. Apart from that, Australia, it is also in the process to upgrade the runway that is present on this island. It is this runway over which our crafts, they landed, right? So the Australian government, it is trying to upgrade the runway of this location so that in future, the Coco Keeling Island, it can be used as a forward operating base. That means a military base 
a secure military installation base to undertake various kind of tactical activities like surveillance from this location for the surrounding places okay however this proposal it is pending the approval of the australian parliament because this the cost of this project is quite high so that is why they require the permission of the australian government now what is the importance of this visit see according to a australian think tank known as strategist this is a ground breaking visit to australia by indian military aircrafts see the purpose of this was first expand the strategic reach of indian military we want to increase the area in which we have strategic partnerships with other countries specifically in indo pacific region why do we need it because of the increased presence of china see directly we are not confronting china anywhere but we want to increase the surveillance in the indian ocean location why because we want to protect our lines of trade what this is we'll come in the next slide we also want to improve our cooperation and interoperability with australia what does interoperability mean we can collaborate easily they can work on our equipments we can work on their equipments so interoperability we want to increase that in order to improve our defense and military relations also coco island you can see the location of the coco island over here so the coco island it can be a very important base where the indian ships the indian aircrafts they can go for refueling activities so they can go there if they are in any other region of the world of the eastern side of the world they can go there get refueled and then start their work again also it is very important for air surveillance a joint air surveillance of the region by both australia and india specifically with regards to maritime choke points through the southeast asia and entire eastern indian ocean so if you see over here this is what malacca strait now malacca strait is a very important strait where a huge amount of goods and goods they move from one place to another for india as well as for australia even for china malacca strait has a very high importance to reduce the importance of malacca strait china wanted to establish the kra to create kra isthmus to convert this kra isthmus in a canal like the panama canal in thailand however this project it didn't take off okay so this is malacca strait malacca strait is very important for trade between the various countries right so that is why we want to protect we want to ensure that no one country has any kind of hegemony or shows any kind of aggressive stance in this particular region we pro want to protect our lines of trade apart from that apart from this economic importance the access to both coco island as well as christmas island now christmas island is also another island of short territory of australia now if india gets the access to both these islands we will be able to monitor the indian ocean region this part the south southeastern part of the indian ocean region we can ensure that no particular country has hegemony in this region us also wants india to increase its presence in the region as a counter to china right so that is why we established this quad grouping us japan india and australia japan india australia all three of them are what they all three of them can help the usa in controlling the hegemony of china 
However, India has never released any joint statement with the other three countries against the aggressive stance of China in the Taiwan region. We covered that yesterday. Right? So, this is also covered. We want to protect our lines of trade and communication. We want to check increasing Chinese presence in the Indian Ocean region. And it will also, very, also be a very important step towards becoming a blue water navy. A blue water navy is a navy which has a global presence. Like USA. USA, it is where? In North America. So distant. Still, it has its ships in Diego Garcia region in the Indian Ocean region, right? So, it has a global presence. India also wants to become a blue water navy. Now, while we are talking about blue water navy, there are also two other types of navies. One is green water navy. A green water navy is one which has a regional presence, especially which is able to protect its coastal waters. Then there is also a brown water navy. What is brown water navy? Brown water navy is the one which is capable of conducting operations in shallower water bodies like rivers, like lakes and also in littoral environments. Okay. So brown water navy, it, this term came during the World War II. When the U.S. Navy, it started using Mississippi water, Mississippi River for its naval activities. Now, Mississippi River had brown water. So, that is why this is known as brown water Navy. Okay. So, this is about that particular topic. We come to the next topic regarding the cinematograph act. Sorry, bill. It hasn't been passed yet. It has been passed in Raj Sabha. So what is this bill? What are the concerns that are being stated in this particular article? See, Raj Sabha, it has cleared the cinematograph amendment bill to replace the cinematograph act of 1952. So 1952 was a very long time ago, right? 70 years. So we want to replace such an old act because a lot of things they have changed since then. Now there was in the year 2000 a ruling by the Supreme Court under the case K.M. Shankarappa case. Now under this ruling by the Supreme Court it was stated by them that center cannot exercise any revisional power on the films that have already been certified by the Central Board for Film Certification. So, if any film, it has already received a CBFC certificate, then it is screened in the theatres. After the screening, the central government they cannot have any control over the movie. They cannot change the movie. They cannot exercise any kind of revisional power. For example, if the movie got an UA certificate, the center after the screening of the movie cannot say that instead of UA, the movie should get an A certificate. Okay. So that was in this Krishna M. K. M. Shankarappa case. However, in this particular bill, it has been clearly stated the bill, it allows the center to order the CBFC to re-examine the films that have already been cleared for the exhibition. So, this is point number one of contention. This goes against this case. Also, there has been an expansion of the rating system. Right now, we have U, that is for universal audience, UA. For the universal audience under adult supervision, we have A category films only for 18 plus people and we have the S category, the special category made for screening for certain special category of people only, right? However, the Sham Benical Committee 
which was established in 2016 and gave its report in the year 2017. It asked the government, it recommended the government to expand the age ratings of the movie. Now, USA also had these kind of age ratings. So, India on the same regard will have multiple age ratings for the movie. Now, why did that recommendation was given by the Sham Benegal Committee? To reduce, to ensure that the CBFC, it functions only as an agency that gives the ratings and not an agency which censors or ask the movie makers to cut certain parts of their movie in order to give them any kind of rating. Okay, so that was the intention of the Sham Benegal Committee and they recommended that UA, the adult supervision category, it should now be divided into UA 7 plus only children above the age of 7 under the adult supervision can watch the movie, 13 plus above 13 under adult supervision and 16 plus, 16 plus under adult supervision. So that was included. However, the government did accept it. They did expand it. However, they did not take away this power to censor. Okay. So CBFC still has the power to both rate the movies as well as censor the movies. So, despite this reclassification, CBFC, the Central Board for Film Certification, it still has the power of censorship. Specifically with regards to aspects like use of nudity, use of swear words. It's not like if these things are present in a movie, they'll directly get a certificate. No, they will get a certificate, but these kind of uh, scenes they will either have to be edited or removed from the movie in order to get a certificate for screening. Also what are the various other provisions of this particular bill? See right now what happens is that the certificate that is given by CBFC is valid only for 10 years. But the bill, it provides that these certificates, they will be perpetually valid throughout India for, for perpetual amount of time. There are also various sections included to address the issue of piracy. With the improvement in technology, what is happening? Piracy, it is increasing by leaps and bounds, which is highly violative of the Copyright Act. So for that, section 6AA has been included, which prohibits any kind of recording, helping a person to record, transmission of any infringed copy of a film, that is a pirated copy of the film, at a licensed place for exhibition. So section 6AA prohibits all these activities. Section 6B, it prohibits public exhibition of an infringed copy or a pirated copy of a film for profit. For example, suppose your colony RWA, it organizes a small film festival. So they have organized this film festival, they are asking you for a nominal fee. They are asking you for say 50 rupees per person. They are screening a particular movie, say Oppenheimer. Okay, so they are screening this particular movie. However, it was found out that they downloaded that movie from Torrent. They did not use proper channels to get access to the movie, right? So then the RWA, they can be penalized in such a case. So the violation, in case any violation is done of these, sub, these sections of this bill, then a jail term of minimum three months and maximum up to three years, the people, they can undergo that. Secondly, there will also be a fine. Apart from jail term, there will be also a fine of up to 5% of a film's gross production cost. 
See, when the film it goes to the theater, the director tries to get back the cost that they had to endure during the production of the film. But when you pirate a movie, what happens? You are not paying any kind of money to watch the movie. So there is a loss of the producer, the director, the entire team of the film making, right? So that is why up to five percent of the gross production cost of the movie it can be fined. But this should this cannot be less than three lakh rupees. If the film was produced only for ten lakh. So, what will be the five percent? It will be very meager amount. I think five thousand rupees, right? So, what will happen? The person they will not be charged with such small fine. They'll have to give minimum of three lakhs and maximum of five percent of the film's gross production cost. Also, has there been any provision regarding the control on the OTT platforms under this bill? See, directly they have not mentioned the OTT platforms at all. What is OTT? Over the top. So, these platforms they provide using your internet service provider, various entertainment facilities to you. So, they are basically riding over. The internet providers, so internet providers are giving you the internet, and oh, through that they are providing you the entertainment. So that is why they are known as over-the-top services. So the bill does not clearly state in specific words OTT platforms. However, it states that the Central Board for Film Certification it will be empowered. To sanction separate certificates to films on for exhibition on television or any such media, there will be a separate certificate for the theaters. Now, once that movie it comes out of the theater, it's done, it's run its course. Now it is sent on TVs or other social medias. For that, a separate certification will be provided by the CBFC. This is specifically to ensure that the uncensored versions they do not find their way on these other social media channels. These other social media channels. When the government says this, this is a tongue-in-cheek approach of saying the OTT platforms. Also, the Minister of Information and Broadcasting, Mr. Anurag Thakur, in his address to Rajya Sabha, he clearly stated, when this particular issue of OTT platforms, use of course, course language, violence, and other things on OTT platform, this question was raised. Mr. Anurag Thakur also said. That he has asked the various OTT platforms, the consortium of all these OTT platforms, to come up with certain self-regulation guidelines, which come under which come under the purview of the Code of Ethics of the IT Act. So this will give them with self-regulatory powers, so that they can regulate the type of content that comes on their platform. If they fail to do so. Minister said that if they fail to do so, he has also warned these OTT platform providers that the government itself will come up with various steps to do the same. So this is the entire crux of the Cinematograph Act of India. Okay, sorry, the Cinematograph Cinematograph Bill of India. Now in the prelims bite section. We have one article, which is regarding the World Coin Project. What is World Coin Project? Now, this is a project by the CEO of OpenAI, whose product is what? Chat GPT. So, this is a product of Sam Altman. See the model of this World Coin Project. World Coin. Coin is there, so there must be some financial aspect related to this project, right? So according to this model, you should allow, if you allow your eyes to be scanned in order to prove your human uniqueness, you, all the humans, they have unique irises and that is why in Aadhaar system, 
our retina or the iris scan is done, right? So under this project, if you are able to prove your uniqueness by getting your eyes scanned, then you can receive some cryptocurrency known as WLDO crypto and an ID known as world ID in exchange of it. So basically he wants to establish an entire financial system in which you do not have to give any personal information like your name, like your number, like your home address. You don't have to do give any that information. You just have to get your retina scanned. That will generate a unique ID for you. Using that ID and the money and the cryptocurrency that you're getting after the scan, you can use that money for exchange, right? You can get involved in the crypto exchange related to this currency. Now this is inspired by the Aadhaar system of India. In the Aadhaar system, the iris scan of the people, it, it helped in identifying the unique IDs, unique identities of the people. So this stopped people from signing up multiple times to receive any kind of social benefits. Now this will be done, this particular activity of scanning your eyes, it will be done using this particular device known as orb. Okay, this sounds very sci-fi types, right? So this orb, it will be used by volunteers, by world coin volunteers known as orb operators. Now these orb operators, they will scan your iris pattern, collect this biometric data about you and after they collect this data, you will get an ID associated with it. Now what is the claim with this regard? The claim is that they want to build, Sam Altman wants to build the world's largest identity and financial public network. They want to establish this financial network based on the biometric identity of the person. So that means because the biometric identity is involved over here, that means there will be no barriers of countries and federal banks and other benefits that are associated with the cryptocurrency. Now users, once they get these world coins, when, once they get their world identity, they will be able to buy and sell these coins. Also the volunteers, the orb operators in exchange for their services, they are getting these WLD crypto coins. Now this crypto coin, it is based on the Ethereum blockchain system. The, the biggest crypto coin associated with Ethereum blockchain system is Ether which is the second biggest cryptocurrency in the world after Bitcoin. Now this uses a technology known as zero knowledge proof, which is an encryption technology that helps it maintain the privacy of the users. Now this has been claimed by Mr. Sam Altman. He also claimed that this particular system, this entire system, it is compliant with one of the strictest privacy policy of the world. That is the general data protection regulation of the European, of the European Union. Also, is it present in India? Yes. There are certain cities like Delhi, Noida and Bangalore where the activities of these orb operators and the world coin, it has already started. But what is the criticism? See, this is a biometric information collection system, right? This is very sensitive type of information. It is very unique to every person. So the criticism is that this information, it might get leaked. However, the company claims that after the world ID is generated, this iris images, they are deleted from their system unless the user wants them to keep that information. However, the NSA whistleblower, 
Mr. Edward Snowden, he states that even if the IRS information has gone, the world ID, world ID or the unique identifier for the scan, it, it will still exist and then it can be backtracked and the IRS information can be taken out of the entire system even after it is deleted. So this is one of the biggest criticism of the WorldCoin project. Okay, so that is all. These are all the topics we wanted to cover in today's Hindu news analysis. Here are two main practice questions. First is mob lynching and vigilantism are growing problems in India. So state some steps that have been undertaken to address this issue both by the government as well as the judiciary. What more can be done? So in the introduction you need to mention them that over the past few years these activities they have been increasing right then you have to state the various steps taken by the courts various statements given by the governments various governments state governments that have already set up various legislations against such activities later on extra steps what can be undertaken First is inclusion in IPC, a separate provision in IPC. You also need to state that how civil society, how civil society, it needs to be more proactive in order to reduce the any such activities. The second question is financial inclusion is not a number to be stated on papers. People need to be actively using the financial systems to be called financially included. Elucidate in context of India. So you can mention how India, after the success of Jandhan Yojana, had, has almost 80% of the population who has their bank accounts. But many of these bank accounts, they are inactive. Then you can state how these bank accounts are inactive, how there exists a differences difference in bank accounts, active and inactive bank accounts in case of gender, in case of rural urban divide, in case of levels of income. You also need to state how the digital use of digital transaction, it is much below the global average. So you can mention all these points. It states elucidate. So that means you need to give examples. So if you give your examples and you have data to back those examples, then your answer will be more rich. You'll get better marks. Okay. So this is just 10 marks, 150 words. So with that, we come to an end to this particular session. I hope you were able to understand all the concepts. Do not forget to head to our Telegram channel to attempt a quiz that has been created on this session. So thank you very much for being with me. I'll see you all tomorrow.